Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to welcome you to this online service of worship for March 6, 2022 for Riverside United Church, an affirming community of faith in London, Ontario. My name is Dave Exley, and I'm the lead minister for Riverside. And today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, that season of preparation for Holy Week and, and Easter, the time of year where we lean in closely to hear God's voice in the midst of the busyness of our everyday lives. And to mark this season, we begin a brand new sermon series today, Character and Calling, a Lenten journey with Paul to discover the essentials of Christian character. We'll be exploring throughout this series sections of, of Paul's letters to the early church as we consider what it means to follow in the way of Christ. And while we, we all come with our preconceived notions of, of what it means to exemplify Christian character, it will be important for us to set aside those assumptions in an effort to be open to God's voice of transformation and new life. What new things does God want us to learn during this holy season? Well, friends, as conflict and war continues to rage overseas in Ukraine, we turn our hearts and minds to the Ukrainian people today and in the days ahead. We pause in solidarity as we begin this service of worship. Solidarity with all of those who fight for justice and peace May we continue to keep our eyes and ears open to the voice of love that guides us into a more hopeful tomorrow. A reading from Romans chapter 10, verse 8 to 13. I will be reading from the Common English Bible. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message of faith that we preach. Because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and in your heart you have faith that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trusting with the heart leads to righteousness, and confessing with the mouth leads to salvation. The scripture says all who have faith in him won't be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord is Lord of all who gives richly to all who call on him. All who call on the Lord's name will be saved. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. 
And friends, let us pray. O creative God, source of all beauty, you give light to the soul. Open our hearts as we listen for your word and open our minds as we dream with you. Reveal your life-giving truth that comforts and disturbs us through Jesus the Christ. Amen. When I was 19 years old, I, tra I traveled across the border with a group of friends to see a concert at the legendary Fox Theater in Detroit. The headliner that particular evening was The Cult, a post-punk hard rock band from England, while the opening act was rising star and new artist at the time, Lenny Kravitz. As you might expect, the, the concert venue that night was filled with edgy young adults in leather jackets and wild hair. And while the vast majority of the gathered community was there to see the cult, the audience did at least appear to be somewhat curious about the opening act. Despite that curiosity, I could have never predicted what would unfold in the moments before Mr. Kravitz and his band left the stage as their set came to an end. What happened that night was one of the most unexpected things I've ever witnessed at a rock concert. You see, just before he finished his set for the evening, Lenny Kravitz closed with one final song, his debut single, Let Love Rule. As the song reached its climax, Kravitz set aside his guitar, pulled the mic off the stand, and moved out closer to the audience. He began to speak words that one would usually only expect to hear in church. Even though the words echoed the lyrics of that song, Let Love Rule, they still surprised me. Kravitz seemed to transform from rock star to evangelist in the blink of an eye. As he spoke, he invited the thousands packed in that concert venue that night to join hands with the persons on either side of them. It was almost like an out-of-body experience for me as I listened to him speak about one love, one God, one common cause for humanity, while the crowd raised their joined hands above their heads and swayed to the rhythm of the music. As I stood there, in the cheap seats, watching this group of misfit cult fans participating in this act of peace, unity, and love, I was speechless. If you would have told me before the concert began what was going to happen that night, I wouldn't have believed you. As I stood there, a young adult searching for meaning, lost in those beautiful melodies and words that spoke to my soul, I can't help but think that if someone had, had have leaned in at that moment and whispered into my ear the opening line from Paul's letter to the Romans, that reading we just heard, I would have had chills run down my spine. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The word that night was indeed near me and all others who were packed into that concert hall. As I look back, I can't help but think that this, this might have been one of the most powerful and certainly unexpected spiritual experiences I've ever had. The work that the Apostle Paul does in his letter to the Romans is not at all unlike the work that Lenny Kravitz did that night in Detroit more than 30 years ago. In his letter, Paul writes to an audience that is mostly unfamiliar with him. He longs to bring the people together and help them tap into something deeply spiritual and profound, something already planted in the souls of the people. Paul longs to let his belief in the way of Christ flow out through his words so that the people he reaches might believe as he believes, be comforted as he has been comforted. Paul talks passionately about God's saving power because he is someone that has experienced it firsthand. Like every community of faith that chooses to follow in the way of Christ, what we so desperately need to do is to learn to sing the song that Paul first sang to the masses in his letters of faith. 
For far too many notes and melodies in our tradition tend to fall flat. They fail to sing in harmony with Paul's notes and with the songs Jesus sang through his living. The words that, that Paul writes in chapter 10 of his letter to the Romans have been highlighted by preachers across centuries and times. Sadly, many of those preachers have used these words to suggest that the God of Jesus demands, as the first act of faith, that we swear allegiance to him. I use the male pronoun here deliberately. They suggest, some of them at least, that Jesus is no different from the rulers of his time. He demands that we bend the knee to him or suffer the consequences. If ever there was a melody that failed to reflect the life and teaching of Jesus and Paul, it is this. As the great Richard Rohr so eloquently put it, Jesus didn't demand that we worship him. He invited us to follow him. And those are two very different things. When Paul states, all who call on the Lord's name will be saved, he's not suggesting that we must know the right password in order to experience salvation, peace, and unity with God. Paul is simply widening the doorway that leads to God, knocking down the barriers that stand in the way. I like, I like the way that Eugene Peterson translates this section of Paul's letter. In the message translation, he writes, Everyone who calls help God gets help. Everyone who calls help God gets help. Paul has just stated that in Christ there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. In other words, God isn't a God that favors one tribe over another, one tradition over another, one race over another, one gender over another, one kind of person over another. God is a God of inclusion, of love, of salvation for all. And so, when it comes to the topic of belief, the words of Paul, coupled with the life and teachings of Jesus, remind us that we're called to believe in the things that Jesus believed in. To believe in him is to believe in inclusion. To believe in the image of barriers being knocked down and love flowing freely into all the world. To believe in him is to believe in one another. We had an interesting discussion this, uh, this past week during our online Lenten study as it relates to the topic of belief and the Christian faith. A number of Riverside folk are, are meeting uh, each week during Lent to watch and discuss the Living the Question series, Pro-Future Faith, featuring eco-theologian Reverend Michael Dowd. One thought-provoking and, and quite challenging statements that he made in this week's session was, he said, being Christian isn't about beliefs. It's about living in a way that is saving the future. I loved the, the conversation that flowed from looking at this statement. People weren't afraid to, to challenge Dowd's assertion, to reinterpret it and ponder how it might change our thinking as it relates to our faith. I think it's safe to say that, that where we landed on this was to say that beliefs are, are critical, but only in so much as they lead to action and inner contemplation, the results that we see as a result of those beliefs. I think what Michael Dowd is trying to say here is that beliefs, in other words, professing faith in Jesus and making specific doctrinal statements, isn't the most important thing when it comes to following in the way of Jesus. Jesus was less concerned about professions of faith than he was with knocking down barriers and creating a better world for future generations. Our commitment must be to the future that has yet to be written. Our focus has to move beyond our individual lives and interests 
and move to something else, something stronger, something deeper. I like how Michael Dowd summarized what it means to love God in the way of Christ. He said, Loving God means prioritizing the long-term well-being of the whole over the short-term self-centeredness of the parts. If we are to embrace the concept of a God who offers salvation to all who cry out for help, we must be willing to hear those voices that call also from the future, that future that has yet to be written. Their voices matter too. Perhaps our calling as people of faith is to look forward into that unknown future in the same way that a young Lenny Kravitz looked upon the crowd at the Fox Theater years ago. He looked out and saw possibility. He saw unity. He looked out and showed faith in that crowd, faith in us, belief in us, and in turn, in humanity. God looks at us through the same lens. God sees the possibilities that exist within us, even when others do not. God believes in our ability to sing together, to join hands with those around us, to be one as God is one. Now, Lenny Kravitz didn't single-handedly create that moment of unity years ago. He simply tapped into something that is already embedded into all humankind. A desire to unite. A desire to be one. A belief in something more powerful than any single one of us. All we need is a reminder. That's what Kravitz did. He reminded us of a truth that was, and is, planted in us and in all humankind. Years later, Kravitz would go on to write a song called Believe. It might be fitting to close with just a few lines from that song, for perhaps that night in Detroit inspired him to write these words. Remember, this isn't a, a Christian artist singing these words to a subset of church-going music fans. This is a mainstream artist writing these words. In his song, Believe, he writes and sings, The Son of God is in our face, offering us eternal grace. If you want it, you got to believe. Just put your faith in God and one day you'll see it. The future, the future is in our present hands. Let's reach in. Let's understand. If you want it, you got to believe. All those things we long for in this world of darkness and despair, all the hopes and dreams we have for the future that has yet to be written, if you want it, you got it. You just have to believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. And let us pray. O gracious and loving God, may the faith within us get out onto our lips, into our feet and hands, through our hearts. May what we sing and pray in this hour get past our inhibitions and into our actions this week. May the passion for your gospel burn within our hearts so that we cannot be silent in the face of deception or injustice. If old-fashioned ways of sharing faith do not ring true to us, then let us persist until we find ways to tell our story that reveal your presence in our lives. Help us, God. Please help us to just get out, not arrogantly, but as our humble confession of what we believe. And now, loving and faithful God, we turn to you, lifting up all the silent prayers of our hearts in this moment for people and places around the world. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love answer. And gracious God, where there are no words, we turn to your words 
as we lift up this adapted version of your prayer, praying together. O breathing life, your name shines everywhere. Release a space to plant your presence here. Imagine your possibilities now. Embody your desire in every light and form. Grow through us this moment's bread and wisdom. Untie the knots of failure binding us as we release the strands we hold of others' faults. Help us not forget our source, yet free us from not being in the present. From you arises every vision, power, and song from gathering to gathering. Amen. Friends, as we conclude this service of worship, as you go out into the world, I pray that the God of hope may fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of God's Spirit. Friends, go into this Lenten season listening for that future that has yet to be written. Listen and have faith. Believe in what God can accomplish using us and others around us. Go now.
in peace. Amen.